So, uh, hi, hi everyone, thanks for coming. I am Nacho Coloma, I work with the Solution Engineering team at Google Cloud Platform. Um, I work from the Berlin office, uh, that means that I work with companies helping them deploy on Google Cloud uh, from big corporations to small companies. Hey, how many of you actually know uh, Matt Feigal from the Amsterdam office? Really? Okay, so you have one here and yeah, probably also Martin in the other, the, in the other room. So basically uh, what we do is to help ca uh, companies deploy in the cloud. Um, today we are going to be talking to be talking about Kubernetes and it's going to be challenging because I have materials for like I have materials for something like 50 minutes if we, if we want to use them. Um, so we are going to drop stuff. Um, I have a couple of questions to understand exactly what to focus on. So first of all, how many of you understand containers are, and already know what containers are? Okay. Um, how many of you are using containers in production? Okay, and using any kind of orchestration system, Mesos, Kubernetes, uh, your own thing? Okay. Okay, so... So first of all, um, um, first of all, and I, I'm going to give you the 30 seconds presentation into containers. A, a container is basically the same thing as a virtual machine, only you remove the operating system inside. <coughs> so where typically you would have, for example, a Windows system and inside you have a Linux and you can do that because there are different operating systems, but you have a virtual machine there. What we're doing these days when using containers is that you remove the extra operating system. Inside and outside, it's Linux. So you can do things like, uh, like deploying Docker, in this case, Docker containers. And Docker is going to just add a small layer of abstraction about the files that have changed from the overall operating system, from the host operating system. So something that you can do is consider containers as much more lightweight than a virtual machine. If you're thinking about VMware, you're uh, you're moving or VirtualBox or uh, or QM, you're bringing an entire operating system with your virtualized environment. When you're doing that with a container, you're bringing something that is much more lightweight, and you can start deploying things like that. So at Google, we have been deploying containers uh, for something like 10 years. Uh, we started in uh, around 2005, and. What we use at Google are not Docker containers, they are Borg containers, they are slightly different, but everything in Google uh, works inside of a container. So Google Search, Google Maps, uh, Google Maps, anything that you can think about, uh, it's, uh, it runs in a container. Meaning that today we're deploying 2 billion new, con new containers per week. That's a huge number. And if you can put that in comparison with how big our operations uh, team is, it, it's mostly like, like that. We are not growing that fast. So you can see that the number of the number of things that we have to run in our infrastructure is growing much faster than our team. And that means that we need a new generation of tools that helps us manage clusters instead of individual machines. We need to be able to manage applications and clusters instead of worrying about this particular machine is down, where is this, uh, this concrete machine, and I'm going to replace this machine with this other. And this is what containers is, uh, containers on board uh, are. A little bit of history about what deploying in a virtualized environment looked like over the years. So since 2004, where we had very little stuff like CH root and jail, uh, jail environments, we had uh, environments with very limited, uh, very limited uh, containment. Then in 2006, uh, we released Cgroups. Cgroups is part of Borg. And Cgroups basically is what makes all the modern containers work. Uh, it's a way of isolating your system, keep, keeping it apart from other systems running on your same machine. So Cgroups, uh, a part of board, was released in 2006. In 2013, we released, let, let me contain that for you, that's a thing. Uh, let me contain that for you, it's a project that was trying to open source all the different tools that we were using inside the board. Let me contain that for you, at some point was discontinued, the best parts were integrated into Docker and uh, in, uh, integrated as part of Docker, and then the project was discontinued. And in 2014, the first release of Kubernetes was, was, uh, was out. And Kubernetes is basically the answer to one question. What happens if what we have learned in 10 years of experience with Borg uh, at Google, 
uh, during these 10 years, we have been increasingly improving the tool, adding new features, modifying stuff, uh, understanding our needs. And we understand that what, the way that we work at Google, it doesn't work like that for the rest of the world. You can adjust take board to everywhere else because the way that we are using uh, that we are, we are using board board is highly specific to Google. But what we did was take okay these 10 years of experience that we have, get it today, develop a system from scratch and make it open source from the get go. And that's Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. So if you're thinking about for example the plane with Docker containers, you're going to have a small system that and you have your Docker container there and for example that's WordPress which is great. But then this WordPress, you need three copies of that and you need a load balancer in front of that. And then you need to communicate that with a MySQL server that is running the same way. You need also a cluster and you need also a load balancer. And Kubernetes is the one that is going to get all these containers up and running and connect them. And this is what we're going to see here today, how that works. Um, Kubernetes uh, is written in Go. It's, it's extremely efficient um, to the point that one of our latest bottlenecks was moving from JSON to actually uh, binary communication using GIRPC because JSON was starting to become a bottleneck for our master server. Processing JSON. Um, Kubernetes works in any cloud provider. It doesn't have to be Google Cloud Platform. And we're going to do a demo with Google Cloud Platform, but you can do that in your own premise, uh, in your premises, on your laptop, on AWS. You can take it wherever you want. Um, <coughs> It's a huge open source project. It's in the top 0 0.0. There is a missing zero there. there is in the, it's in the top 0.001% of GitHub projects. Um, it has thousands of projects that are uh, spinning off of Kubernetes. Many, many um, platform as a service uh, frameworks today, like Cloud Foundry or uh, OpenShift, they are based on Kubernetes these days. Um, so I'm going to jump straight into components. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to get into the explanation of how does uh, Kubernetes work uh, internally. So, or how do you design applications to deploy your Kubernetes? So the first concept is the concept of a pod. So you have your Docker containers, and pods are going to deploy multiple containers at the same time together. If one of them fails, the entire pod fails. The whole idea of this is deploying containers that you need all of them to be up and running at the same time in order to be able to say that your system is good. Say, for example, that you are deploying, I'm going to say, an Nginx server. You are deploying an Nginx server, but then you also need logging, logging and monitoring metrics, metrics of your server and also logging. And you need that to go to this particular place, this particular log sync or this particular metrics and that. You need these three pods to be together, uh, metrics and log monitoring and your Nginx server. So either the three containers are up or none of these containers is, is running. And this is what the pod is going to give you. This is, something, this is one of the lessons that we learned with Gore, that systems also need some smaller systems that need to be part of that. Now, for all practical purposes, and if we're talking about user features, a pod usually more or less is the same thing as one container. If you are thinking about, for example, okay, my WordPress and my Redis server, and I need my or my web server and my Redis server, and I need these two to be really close because uh, containers in the same pod are going to live in the same physical machine. You need Redis and your web server to be really close. Yes, but if you are deploying them in the same pod, which you can do, if you are deploying them in the same pod, then they are scaling at the same time, and you probably don't want that. Maybe Redis, you need three copies of Redis, but five copies of your web server, or the other way around. You need independent scaling. And if you are deploying them both in the same pod, then they are, the, then they are scaling at the same time. So typically, good examples about containers in the same pod, logging and monitoring of your application, that's perfect. That, that belongs to the same pod. Otherwise, think about them as separate pods. That's usually the best way uh, to think about scaling. The containers inside of the same pod, they can, they can communicate via local host and they can also, uh, they, uh, and they are expected to be ephemeral, meaning that a pod can die anytime. If you are deploying a pod and you think, okay, this is going to be here tomorrow, maybe not. Because Kubernetes can kill a pod anytime, and that's expected. It's expected that it's going to be killing your pods and moving them around. And you, your application should be designed to, to respond to that. So, that's pods where our containers are deployed. And this is an example of a pod. Everything in Kubernetes is a YAML file or JSON file. The usual examples are in YAML. And all files that we're going to see here today, uh, they all start with 
which kind of file is this? Wait, what, what am I describing here? And in, in this case, it's going to be a pod. And the most important part, uh, part of the deployment descriptor here is the image. In this case, we're deploying a WordPress image. When you're deploying a Docker container or Rocket container, you can deploy uh, both with Kubernetes. When you're deploying a, a container, there are two ways of specifying your URL. In this case, just the name of the image. This belongs to Docker Hub. And Docker Hub is a little bit like GitHub. It's a place where anyone can upload their own images. And if you're searching for this particular image, which I could if I was connected to the internet. Uh, a sec. Uh, can I get the can I get the name of the of the because yeah. Can I get the name of the oh you can see here. It's a sign. Is this the, the, the is the password introduced as WPA or? No, no, no. It's not on network. It's just the yeah. you have a sign page. Okay. Just about the page and just login. continue with the, with the presentation and then I'm going to try to connect it in some way. So what you can see on Docker Hub, what you can see on Docker Hub is um, it's the same, the, the same format of GitHub. You're going to have users, you're going to have uh, containers for these users. And there, some of these containers are official. In this case, the WordPress container is official. And you can select which version of WordPress you want, and you can see documented there which environment variables this container is receiving. If you were doing this with your own private images, uh, your own private image uh, with Google Cloud Platform, you're going to have uh, a Docker container registry, which is under the URL gcr.io slash your project slash your image. And there, there you can use uh, your own uh, private image. So yeah, two options typically, a Docker Hub or a Google Container Registry. Docker Hub is you're using a, a public image. Google Container Registry fits <coughs> your own thing. <coughs> so we have pods, which is where our containers live, and we have nodes, which are our physical machines. A, pod cor a, a node corresponds with a physical machine on physical infrastructure, if you were deploying on your own premises. And in the case of Google Cloud Platform, a node is going to be a Google Compute Engine virtual machine. Um, then you have pods, which is where our containers live, and you have nodes, which is our physical physical machines or Compute Engine virtual machines if, if, if on Google Cloud Platform. And then you have services, and services are your load balancers. Services are this public IP address that I'm going to be using with this particular port, and these are long living entities. A pod can be destroyed anytime soon, a service is going to be there for t uh, as long as you want. So there are two different kinds of services for practical purposes. One of cluster IP, and the other one is load balancer. 
Load balancer is going to be uh, is going to be transformed into a native entity of your cloud provider. On Google Cloud Platform, that means a load balancer or a Google Cloud Platform load balancer. Our load balancers are powered by Maglev. Maglev is our uh, load balancer that we use for Gmail, Google Search, YouTube. When you're deploying something on Google Cloud Platform and using Kubernetes to do that on Container Engine, you're going to have uh, automatically uh, configure a load balancer for any service that you configure of type load balancer. You're going to be using our load balancers. If you were using Cluster IP, this is going to be as a software managed, uh, um, a load balancer that is managed by software, that is managed by Kubernetes. And it's going to be done using IP tables. So you're going to have a, a proxy automatically configured by Kubernetes using IP tables to manage your traffic. From your node, your traffic is going to arrive to the node and from the node to the pod transparently using IP tables. Mm. Last but not least, all these services are going to be visible everywhere in your cluster. When you're defining multiple services, all these, and uh, you define a service for MySQL, another service, for example, you're doing microservices and you need a service for authentication, another service for invoicing, another service for user data. All these services are going to be visible everywhere in your cluster at, as DNS variables, uh, as DNS host names, and as environment variables. Meaning that you you can access your MySQL just by write, uh, by writing uh, HTTP. Well, HTTP is a bad protocol for that, but you can just access your MySQL host name. You're going to have that alive everywhere in your cluster. So all your services are visible as DNS names. And how do you connect that? Because yes, you have pods, which is your containers. You have your physical, your physical machines, and you have the service. But how do you connect the service to your pods? And actually, everywhere in Kubernetes, you can use labels. And labels are a combination of key-value pairs, anything that you can think of. So if you're thinking about data center east, release production, version, or tier, any label, any, any key-value pair that you can think of, you can attach that to any entity inside of Kubernetes. Typically, the most useful are pods here. For example, type is WordPress. And then when you configure the service, you say, this service is fronting any pod which type equals WordPress. And this is one way of transforming, of moving from pets into cattle. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the, with the expression pets or cattle in cloud computing? OK, so the way that we used to do things uh, like 10 years ago, uh, when you had to manage a, a huge number of machines, you give them, you give each one of them a specific name, and you treat them with particular attention to each one of them. So, for example, you are going with Disney characters, and you have Mickey, Minnie, Pluto, and then when Pluto gets sick, when something is wrong with Pluto, then you connect specifically to that machine. Your pet is sick, you take it to the veterinary. You connect to Pluto, you fix what is wrong with it, and then you restart the machine or whatever. When you're working with cloud computing these days, we think more about uh, more in terms of cattle. And cattle means that, for example, uh, for starters, the names are terrible. The names are not Mickey, uh, Mickey or Pluto. The names are Europe was one D uh, WX uh, one fed. This is the name of your machine. Names are terrible. And when when your machine is when something is wrong with this particular machine. Yes, you connect to the machine and you fix. Uh, you try to isolate the problem, but you don't fix that particular machine because if you do that, you get a snowflake. You get a specific server that has a configuration different to your cluster, and you want all your machines to be the same. You want cattle. So what you do, with, you fix the template, and you do, uh, what you do then, you modify the entire cluster. You, you make you do a rolling update to modify everything in your cluster. You don't modify a specific machine. So. As cattle, you treat all your servers the same. And if one of your servers gets sick, you kill it, you get another. You can kill a, you can kill a pod anytime soon, and your pod is going to be automatically restarted. So labels are one of, of the ways of achieving capital. Where labels are one of the ways of saying, OK, you know these four pods here? All of them have this label, type is WordPress. And then I'm going to create a service, and this service is going to be in front of all these pods, any pod with this, uh, with this set of labels. So this is an example of how you define a service. Again, YAML file. Uh, everything in Kubernetes is a YAML file. Uh, 
there is a way of using Kubernetes without YAML files, but the recommended way is doing, doing it this way. Um, kind is service in this case. Type is load balancer. Remember that we have different options. We could go with cluster IP or load balancer. Cluster IP will be managed by Kubernetes. Load balancer is going to be managed by Google. And then we use a selector. And the selector is going to be, in this case, any pod with name is WordPress. So we have the pods, which is our containers lead. We have the nodes, physical machines. We have the services, which are our load balancers. And then we have our replica set. And replica sets are going to keep an eye on the number of pods that are alive and well on your system. And if something is wrong, it's going to be starting or stopping uh, pods if it finds that you have either too many or too, uh, or too few. You can auto scale pods. You can, you can configure a replica set and, uh, and say, tell to the replica set, okay, between this number and this number according to user load, for example. Replica sets are going to keep an eye on your pods. It's not common to create a pod manually. Uh, like we said, uh, we have seen in the, uh, in the first slide, we have, we have seen you can create a pod manually. This is not typically what you do, because if you do that, and for any reason your pod dies, no one is going to be restarting your pod. Even if you just want one pod, you do that with a replica set. So that someone is keeping an eye on top of your pod and saying, OK, something is wrong, the pod has died, I'm going to restart it again. So replica sets are going to do that. Replica sets are not uh, used manually. I'm going to jump over this one in particular. Replica sets are not used manually. They are typically uh, automatically created when you create a deployment. And this is our last piece uh, here. When you create a deployment, your deployment is going to describe uh, your desired state of your application. And it's going to say, OK, this is my image. I want four copies of this. Your deployment is going to automatically create a replica set. When you're defining a deployment, and we're going to get into that in the next slide, you can also pause, resume, and rollback deployments. You can define a deployment for version 1.0 of your application. Three copies of this particular container. And then you can say, OK, I'm moving to version 2 of my applications. Still three copies, but with this different version. And then you can say, OK, I want to do a rolling update. I, I want you to, to move from version 1 into version 2. Or you can also roll back and say, OK, this didn't work out, uh, let's move back. We're going to see that in the demo. Uh, deployments keep a history. Uh, keep a history. We're going to uh, we're going to see that. So this is what a deployment looks like. Kind is deployment. We are going to create three different repli uh, replicas. And now the template here is the definition of my pod. This is what my pod is going to look like. And in this case, I want these labels. These are the labels that I'm going to be using in my service to load balance. These are my labels, and this is my image. I'm going to deploy three copies of Nginx with this particular label that is going to be used by my load balance. When you create this in the command line, everything in the command line is cube control. So cube control create dash f and your YAML file. This is going to be automatically creating your deployment. And there is this thing uh, that we bring from board, the difference between desired state of the cluster and actual state of the cluster. You want the cluster to be here. The cluster right now is here. Hey, you wanted to have three copies of this, but you know what? Your cluster is right now on fire. I cannot do anything right now. So for Kubernetes, this difference between where you want to be and where you are right now could be a long living thing. It could, it could last weeks. It could last months. And the server is going to keep trying to do the right thing. So you're asking to create this deployment. This deployment asks for three different pods. And Kubernetes is going to try this. Right now, you have zero. Your pods are going to start one by one. And then at some point, when you ask kube control get deployments, it's going to say, you know what? You wanted three. Right now, you have three. But that's something that could take time. And one of the first things that you're going to see in a real deployment is that you try to deploy something and you don't have enough resources. And your pods cannot be deployed because maybe there is a bug in the pod, or simply you don't have enough resources and you have to debug that stuff. <coughs> now let's say that you have done a deployment. Everything is, is running well. And this is your deployment file, your YAML file. And now I was working with Nginx version 179. And I want to do an upgrade here. I want to move to a new, a new version. So what I do, I 
I go to this file and I, and I make these changes, and all these files are going to be on Git, right? You're going to have your own repository, and you're going to put all your container configuration in, inside of Git. Then you go to that file, you make the, the you make your change, and then the command is slightly different. Instead of cube control create, it's cube control apply. This is the name of the file. And now the column that we're going to be looking at when, when we when we run cube control get deployments, the column is going to be different. It's not desired, not current. We're going to look at up to date. You wanted three, right now you have three, but all three of them are all three of them are with the old version of, uh, of your application. In this case, the old version of Nginx. As you give it some time, new pods are going to be started. And at some point, your, your actual number here, your actual number of pods is going to be higher than three. Because you wanted three with a new version. Right now, you have two with the old version, another two with the new version. And it's going to be starting new pods before, it's st uh, before, before Kubernetes starts shutting down the old version. So at some point, and this is called a rolling update, at some point you're going to have both versions at the same time. And then Kubernetes is going to be slowly increasing the number of updated pods and decreasing the number of old pods. If anything goes wrong and your pod doesn't start, uh, Kubernetes is going to stop it there and say, OK, I, I can take it here. I cannot move forward because your new pod is not deploying correctly. And then you have to fix that situation manually, of course, and try to find out what the problem is. Um, one of the best practices when you're working with Kubernetes is specifying your maximum and minimum amount of memory and CPU that you're going to need. In this case, we're talking, uh, uh, yeah, minimum, uh, minimum number of resources is requests, and maximum is limit. Memory and CPU, in this case, measured in megabytes, which is a fancy word for megabytes. Megabytes and CPU in millis of CPU. So in this case, uh, you can see here a minimum amount of memory of 64 mega, uh, megabytes, maximum amount of memory of 128, and CPU, one quarter of CPU or half a CPU. Specifying your minimum and maximum amount of resources makes it possible to not deploy stuff that cannot work in your container because you don't have enough capacity. And um, yeah. Uh, other stuff as well. If you exceed your CPU, um, Kubernetes is going to try to manage and distribute CPU evenly according to your needs. If you exceed the number of uh, the amount of memory, the maximum amount of memory that you have, uh, your container is going to be killed. So you have to keep track uh, that your container is never trying to exceed the number of the amount, the maximum amount of CPU that you want it uh, for it to have. So. I'm going to jump over, uh, over this slide because this is not that interesting, but one thing is worth mentioning. When you are deploying multiple pods, Kubernetes is going to try to do the right thing, and it's going to try to distribute your pods in multiple nodes, in different machines. So that if, if something dies, it's not killing half of your cluster. It's going to try to distribute your pods in, a, in, multiple, in multiple machines. Um, yeah, let's, let's, jump into, yeah, let's jump into the demo, I think it's... It's going to be better as well. So when you're deploying Kubernetes, you can host it in the cloud or on premises. Uh, you can host it anywhere, actually. Uh, and in the case of Google Cloud Platform, the product that we use for Kubernetes is Container Engine. Uh, if you're going to remember only one thing about Kubernetes, about, about Container Engine, be the first line. It's the easiest way to get started with Kubernetes. It's one line of code. It's actually this line over here. This line is creating a cluster with three nodes, and then you can directly start using Kubernetes. After this, your next line of code can be straight away kube control, get pods, or whatever. Once you are connected to a cluster, uh, what you're using is an open source tool that is independent of the provider. So once you have run this first line, you don't do anything else related to Google Container, uh, Google Container Engine anymore. And that's one of the best things of Kubernetes, that it's 100% independent, or 99% independent, Meaning that once connected to the cluster, it's the same thing if you're working with Google Cloud Platform, your own container, or just your local machine with Minikube. So, container engine has many amazing things. One of them is that, yes, uh, logging and monitoring is integrated out of the box. Uh, you're going to have access to all your metrics in, in Stackdriver. Um, 
And also you can have multi-zone deployments uh, out of the box as well. We're going to see that uh, later. Now for demo time, I need five seconds because I need to restart my machine. Give me a, give me a second here. In the meantime, during these ten seconds, if some, if anyone yes. has questions, on the load balancer, oh, yeah. uh, I didn't understand where where it is. You said that it's per, per service, and uh, each service is in one machine. And if you have multiple machines, how does load balancer deal uh, is, is happening between multiple machines? So when you are when you are creating a service and you have multiple machines behind that. Uh, so, for example, if you're using it of type load balancer, using the native load balancer in, in Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud is going to create um, the load balancer and a, it's called a backend service that is keeping, keeping an eye automatically on all your machines and automatically sending traffic. So Google Cloud Platform is going to be natively sending traffic to your machines. If you're using client IP, it's Kubernetes the one that is going to be sending traffic to your machines. But all these connections are going to be managed for you Behind the, behind the scenes. In the case of Kubernetes, it's going to be using IP tables. In the case of Google Cloud Platform, it's going to be using Andromeda, uh, which is our virtualized network layer. But basically, you can create new pods as long as your pods have these labels that your service is looking for. So for example, your service is configured to, for any pod with type is WordPress. So then any pod that you create, new pod that you're creating with type equals WordPress, is going to be automatically detected and included in your load balancer. So we're going to do something. I created already a cluster uh, before before I came before, because starting a cluster typically takes between one and three minutes. So uh, this is the command that I was running. This is the command that I was running uh, before I, before I came here today, and if. Right now, I ask for my list of clusters. I can see here my cluster up and running. In this particular case, this cluster is running version of Kubernetes 1.4.4. This is one of the things that are amazing. The team that is developing Kubernetes and the team that is uh, developing uh, Google Container Engine are basically most, mostly the same, the same people. So uh, what you are going to see is that a release for Kubernetes and a new release of Container Engine are going to be separated by typically a week. When you are having a Kubernetes new version released every three months, being able to update in a week, that's, that makes a huge difference. So, so uh, this is it, this is my cluster up and running, and I'm going to start deploying things. First of all, uh, this is, I'm going to deploy a MySQL. A MySQL, I'm going to deploy it as a pod. It's going to be a pod, uh, and I'm going to be using this particular label. The label is going to be MySQL. I'm going to be deploying the standard MySQL image from Docker Hub. And yeah, 
And in this case, I'm going to be using a persistent volume, meaning that the data of my database is going to be still there even if my pod dies. So I'm going to create this, this right now. with the command watch <coughs> watch is going to be it's going to be running whatever I, I put next a uh, watch is going to be running that every two seconds it's a standard Linux thing so if I run for example LS is going to be uh, to give me okay if I run LS for example it's going to give me the contents of this folder if I run uh, if I run watch LS it's going to be running LS every two seconds so I'm going to use this command, this watch thing, to give me, in this case, watch cube control get pods. This is my list of pods. So my SQL is already up and running. You can see here that the pod is already is already running, so I can continue creating things. So I'm going to create right now a service. And the service is going to be looking like this. Uh, my simple service. Remember, kind, service, uh, and my selector. This is the filter that I'm going to be applying for labels. My selector is name is MySQL. So this is the service that I'm going to be creating. And the thing is exactly the same. Oh, sorry. MySQL, MySQL service. And if I come here. This is my list of services right now. So I have here MySQL. I didn't specify the type if it was load balancer or, or client IP, so it's going to be client IP by default. It's going to only have a, a private IP address. Uh, can, can I have, sorry? sorry? Can I have like five minutes more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so MySQL is going to be a service that is pointing to my MySQL, MySQL pod, and Kubernetes is an internal service both only with uh, private IP addresses, 10 point something, uh, 10 dot something dot something. So now I'm going to deploy WordPress. And WordPress is going to be slightly different. With WordPress, I am creating a deployment. Remember what, I, what we said before? You never create a pod one by one, you create deployments. And when you're creating a deployment, you're saying, I want two different replicas of WordPress and this is the name of the image that I'm going to be using. So let's create just that. What you're going to see here is that it's, it's slightly different, right? When you're creating a pod, you're creating pets. You can control exactly which name the pet has. But when you're creating cattle, in this case, when you're creating two different copies of WordPress, the names are going to look, uh, they're going to look terrible. And one of the things that you can do is that you can kill one of these pods and it's going to be cre uh, recreated automatically. So, the new pod is already up and running. It takes five seconds to start a pod uh, on Kubernetes. It takes 30 to 40 seconds to start a virtual machine on Google Cloud Platform, 30 to 40 seconds to start a full virtual machine, but when you're creating a pod, it's much more lightweight. And right now, in five <coughs> seconds, the pod is, uh, is up and running. So I can, I can kill the next one, but I'm going to do something funnier than that. I'm going to move from three replicas to four. And from version 4 to version 4.5 of WordPress at the same time. So we're going to be scaling up in the number of, of, of instances, and at the same time, we're going to see how, how well this goes. So saving this, and then
So up here, you're going to see the new containers being created. And down here, I'm going to get the list of deployments. You can see that you want four, but right now you have five pods here. You can see that the number of up-to-date pods is three, but it's being created right now. Creating a container from scratch takes some time because it's this, the time that your container image takes to get downloaded to your machine. If the, if the virtual machine was already, if the image was already downloaded, it would be much faster. And right now it's up and running. And you wanted four, right now you have four and up to date four. If you want to roll back that. You can see how it's undoing all, all that we did, and since the images are already downloaded, uh, it should be much faster to, to create. And as you can see here, the Sire 4 up to date 4, we just now did a roll, rollback from our four copies of pods with uh, WordPress 4.5. We have rolled back to version 4 of WordPress again. So this is how you upgrade and how you roll back when using, when using containers uh, with Kubernetes. We are uh, out of time right now, and so I'm going to cut it short here. Um, I'm going to drop this here. So we can jump into questions right now, and if you want to know specifics about Kubernetes 1.3 or uh, 1.3, 1.4, or 1.5, uh, we can do that. Uh, we can do that afterwards during, during lunch. So, a couple of questions for Q and A. Yeah. yeah. Any questions? Yeah. You have the services one where all the traffic comes in and then you go down. So, so what, do you have any solutions? What if your service goes down? Like my service like would catch fire, so so comes in on one machine and you spread it to all your pods. So one of the things that you can configure with Kubernetes are the URL that your pod is answering to when your pod is healthy. And one of the things that you can configure is okay, so this is my healthy check, my healthy check URL. When, when you configure that, they'll, if you're using Google Cloud Load Balancer, then you have a native health check that is keeping an eye on your service. If your service is down, then that machine is not receiving any more traffic and, until the URL is up again. And then Kubernetes is going to automatically restart either your pod or your node if it fails. So any failing situation should be temporary and Kubernetes should be restarting stuff. Yep. I think this is great for uh, stateless services, but what if you need to or share state between different pods? Um, or what if you have data locality? How can you guarantee that a request goes to a particular pod in some kind of a concept of a session plan? So, two different things here: is saving state in in your pod, uh, saving state in your in your pods, or a user user session persistence in the sense that all user sticky sessions like all user requests come to the same server you can configure sticky sessions as well with kubernetes meaning that all your requests are going to go to the same pod if possible then saving state is something that typically you should try to keep isolated so sharing state between different pods if it's read only, you can mount a persistent drive uh, and multiple machines can share that persistent drive. Otherwise, uh, I would recommend to move it to a separate, uh, to a separate structure. It can be either your, uh, your SQL server, meaning Cloud SQL if you're working with Google Cloud Platform, my SQL is managed by Google, or you can deploy your own thing. Like, I'm going to deploy BTS, I'm going to deploy MySQL, MariaDB, um, uh, Postgres, whatever separate that from the rest of the cluster or deploy that using Kubernetes as well that you can, uh, you can do but keep it separate from your pods keeping as many of your pods as, po uh, as possible stateless 
but none of them can be stateless because you're going to have pets at some point. At some point, you need to keep state, either with pets or with pet sets. And yeah, you can do that, but then try to keep it separate if possible. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, uh,